Okay, so I think that's my cue. Um, thanks very much to everyone for being here uh, into this session on micro-credentials and micro-credentialing approaches. My name is Cormac McLaughlin, and um, I work at DCU, and I'll be speaking to you all on behalf of my colleagues. Um, Professor Mark Brown was meant to give this talk, but he sends his apologies. He's actually engaged in another meeting at the same time. So he got me to do to organize this presentation in his stead. Um, but hopefully it'll be enjoyable and we have about a half hour here. And um, so I'm gonna go through my slides fairly slow. And um, I know for the session in general, we were talking there to Tim and he was pointing out the chat box, the chat bo box is there. So make sure to use it if there's any questions you have during, I don't mind stopping um, as well. And if, if you have any specific questions. So the first thing I'm gonna do is share my screen. And maybe if someone could just indicate once they can see, maybe it's not the heaven. Um, I'm assuming it's now shared. I will go to my current slide. So, um, as I say, my name is Crohar McLaughlin, and it's good to be here. It's a pleasure to be presenting to you all um, on micro credentials at Dublin City University. And to give a kind of overview of this talk before I commence, we've got three really lines of inquiry we want to use to frame this session. The first is to talk a little bit about TCU itself as an institution. Uh, some of you are probably quite familiar with TCU, um, but we're going to give you context and talk about maybe our story when it comes to micro-credentials also. Secondly, we're going to look at current research and the, we're actually involved in several projects at the minute uh, that we think would be interesting for showing some of the trends that are occurring within this research context and research space as well. And then third, we want to kind of help frame the rest of this discussion by looking to the future and talking about some of the core questions that we see on our side as very important strategically that people uh, keep on mind and consider. So first of all, this slide I'm put in is a lovely slide because it's a very important point in so many things in life when we're talking about education. This idea that micro-credentials are not in and of themselves a big idea. They should be in the service of big ideas. We can see behind there the Sustainable Development Goals, which is obviously a roadmap really for humanity in the 21st century. Um, but important, it is important that we take that framing from the very start. When we're talking about credentialing approaches, qualifications, we want to actually talk about what these big ideas are. Not only what is it shaping and how it's being shaped, but why is it being shaped in that specific way? So these are all very important contextual issues to discuss first of all. And now to talk about the DCU story, as I say, some of you are probably quite familiar with DCU. Uh, it's in Dublin City, that's our name of course, Dublin City University. And this is a picture of our campus, which we are all very much missing, I must say. Uh, it's been three or four months since we've been face to face on our campus. Um, but it's in the north, on the north side of Dublin, quite near the airport. And another thing that's probably important to know about DCU is that it's quite a young university. We're actually celebrating our 40th year and um, this year. But from inception, DCU was very much a strategic university. And in addition to that, we've always been at the forefront of when we're talking about digital distance learning. Uh, the university has never been afraid of actually talking about these issues and, and really um, driving forward with a lot of these changes pioneering in a lot of senses. So one example here is our DCU Connected program. And um, you can see this advertisement, but it's a very well regarded distance education program. We have students learning from all over Ireland and some students from all over the world. We're actually doing undergraduate degrees at the minute um, online. So you can see that this is a space we were already in long before discussions about micro-credentials, for example, um, came into being. We were always talking about distance education. In addition to this, something that's probably somewhat newer and something that I've been privileged to actually work on is we've also uh, really put into the book field as well. So we have a strategy with future learning, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, but I was lucky enough to work on this project, Irish 101, um, and it's a series of Irish language MOOCs. They're actually available right now on the Future Learning platform, and many of them are, are available. And we have over 80,000 learners from around the world who have registered to do this course from January 2018 onwards. 
And sometimes people are flabbergasted when they hear this because they think the Irish language, like how on earth, like I didn't know there was an Irish language. But it's an example of how DCU have really tried to pioneer into this space we saw that there is actually a huge market for people to learn about the Irish language and culture around the world. Um, and in addition to that, this is a really transformative opportunity as well. So we've already got a whole research agenda in that sphere too. Um, but MOOCs have been something that we've been looking at and working very closely on. Now, I mentioned future learning, and this slide just highlights um, the nature of our strategic partnership with Future Learn. So we're one of a handful of universities actually around the world um, which have this sort of status with FutureLearn, where we're actually offering master's level qualifications through the platform. So this is used to kind of sketch out contextual information. We're talking about an existing relationship, but very much a strategic one. Now this slide, um, Mark described it as eye candy, but it's actually to illustrate something important also, which is when we're talking about DCU and when we're talking about institutions, I think in general, it's important to contextualize where we sit. And something that we've been looking at within micro credentials very strongly is the fact that this is the national framework of qualifications in Ireland. So you can see it's quite detailed and it lists and structures different types of qualifications. We've always placed huge emphasis on anything that we do being potentially credit bearing. So, for example, we've been in that space, there's a lot of discourse around digital badges, micro credentials. I'll discuss this towards the end. But in addition to that, we've always wanted to do whatever work we're doing in our national affairs. And then in addition to this, to sketch probably something that my colleagues are going to be talking about as well, is the European level also. So a really interesting development recently was about the European uh, Common Micro-Credential Framework, which has been launched. You can see some of the parties that are involved in this towards the bottom. And what's super interesting about this, of course, is that I think this is the direction that all these discussions are heading in towards standardization, towards actually defining and looking at what um, specific contextual factors that we're going to be talking about. You can see here, for example, when we're looking at the common micro-credential framework, um, that the study time involved, for example, is very much specified between 100 and 150 hours and where they sit within a European qualification framework as well, what specific levels they're at, how they link to ECTS credits. So these are bigger discussions, and it's something that we want to reflect on towards the end also, is this concept of the trends that are pushing us from looking at not only nationally, but internationally as well, and have these elements linked here. And say so this is an example of one of our really innovative qualifications that have just actually um, been launched. This is our fintech uh, master's qualification, which is now available on the FutureLearn platform. It launched in February, but you have students from around the world who are actually undertaking this qualification. So again, this is an example of a specific subject that we felt was extremely interesting and extremely um, important and pertinent. And if you go to the future website, you'll see examples of master's qualifications that are available now. And you'll notice that there's only a really handful of universities up there. We've been to the University and um, Queensland University also. So we can see straight away that there's um, really a handful of organizations that are involved at this strategic level. Another element we mentioned, because when we're talking about not only platforms and when we're talking about strategic partnerships, we also need to talk about the means through which micro-credentials are delivered. So we know Digitary is a very important platform to DCU. And it's actually based here in Dublin. We have a strategic partnership, but this actually provider is now, um, I think it's a preferred provider in Canada, and it's also very large in Australasia. So we need to think about this as very much a weave. We have on the one hand the institutional actors, universities, but we also have MOOC providers, platform providers, and then we also have digital solution providers. So these are all contextual elements that are really important to account for. And that kind of finishes me up on DCU's story, for example, or our sort of narrative of where we've come from and where we've come to. But in addition to that, of course, um, we, we did want to discuss our current research agenda, um, which is pretty extensive. And a lot of the kind of projects that we've been looking at um, are very much cross-pollinating. So we've been making sure that uh, there's a lot of like transfer between the different projects that we're involved in. Um, but many of them fit into the micro-credential space. So I'm going to mention a few. 
The first one here is the DigiHE project. Um, this is a project which is actually um, run by the European University Association. Um, and it's a very close strategic partner of DCU. DCU is an active member. And there's actually been a survey, which I think finishes up this week, um, but it has had respondents from all over Europe. Um, and it has been, uh, it has many questions on the survey relate to micro-credentials and micro-credentialing approaches also. One that's very important is skill net. So whenever we're talking about these discussions, an interesting voice that's sometimes absent is actually that of employers. And um, so this is an important partnership we've had. We received some funding recently to actually query employers and employees. I'll show some of the examples um, from students or some of the examples of questions that we have had so far. Um, but SkillNet is a really important partnership for DCU because it looks into this in an applied sense and as an applied example. So a, this is an example of research that actually is really critical. And um, it was done undertaken as part of the Quality and Qualifications Ireland framework with kind of remarkable results in a sense. Now, you'll note the question is phrased, how important are digital badges during the recruitment process? Um, but you'll see that the overwhelming majority of recruiters said they're not important. And about a quarter said that they were important. Now, the reason that this is quite interesting as well is we could ask what would it be like if it were phrased in the future tense, for example? And um, would it be somewhat different? How important will it be in the future? There were items relating to that on the survey. Um, but it's an important issue worthy of discussion is the employer voice as well, and also employees. So these are the kind of topics of the survey that we've launched as part of SkillNet. Um, you can see that there are separate sections for employers and employees. Um, we really wanted to get into the, the weeds and understand not only how familiar employers are, say, with micro-credentials, but in addition to that, we wanted to look at what are the potential uses they see, what are the factors that would actually influence whether or not they'd adopt it within their specific context. And then on an employee side also, something that was obviously a little bit different um, was to talk about how much they understood or were familiar with micro-credentials and then engagement with CPD, also very important issues. Um, so these are all kind of focusing on that element too, that it's not purely academic, but that in addition to that, we're focusing on uh, the workplace and actually seeing A, how much awareness there is of these topics, but then B, when we move beyond that, what are the kind of drivers at that level? So I know that our colleagues here from Finland who are um, involved in our ECIU project, the European Consortium of Innovative Universities, are probably going to mention this. But this is a really interesting project that we've been involved in with about 12 partners all across Europe. Um, and this is a really transformative project. Essentially, we're all coming together and we're going to be implementing, hopefully, micro-credentials and perhaps uh, innovative new learning approaches as well. Um, but within the ECIU University, we have a fairly strategic role also, which is that we're actually looking and surveying at attitudes and approaches to micro-credentials. So this is a survey that's just gone live, actually. And we have about 90 responses from all across our universities, our partner universities within the project. Um, and an example of a question here, one of the first questions in the survey is about based on your own knowledge of micro-credentials, and we wanted to understand how different persons in different roles would articulate and describe their own um, understanding of micro-credentials, what they are, what they aren't as well. And to share maybe some very preliminary analysis on this question, um, we did know responses that a lot of confusion is present at different levels of academia in terms of what a micro-credential is, what distinguishes it from a short course. I'm going to talk very briefly about definitions towards the end. Um, but these are critical questions because we're often finding that lecturers, support staff, administrative staff are coming back and saying that they're not sure what a micro-credential is. And if they're not sure what a micro-credential is, a knock-on question will be how sure will people that we want to take micro-credentials actually be um, of what a micro-credential is also. So that's a very strategic project that we're involved in. Um, and all of these projects, the reason they're illustrated is, I'm sure you can all see the common trends in between each different strand and each different project that's involved there. 
Um, but it also weaves back to our narrative about our institution, and the fact that our institution is very much a kind of strategic one that's looking at specific opportunities. And to do that, a really important element is to actually look towards the future and to see the future as well as not just something that occurs, but it's also something that is shaped and that we play really a central role in shaping also. So mindful of the fact that there are going to be other speakers in this session too, uh, we wanted to actually discuss this to look to the future and what are the kind of core questions that exist right now regarding a future of micro-credential approaches. And we have three sorts of major issues here. The first is definitions. And the second are drivers and tractors. And Mark had a lovely point yesterday because he noted that, you know, when we're talking about drivers, push factors, the reasons people do things, attractors, pull factors, you know, the, the reasons people want to do things as well are also important. But then a critical third aspect is the language we use and the types of metaphors we use. So often metaphors, when we're using them, reveal an awful lot about how we think about things. And obviously there are different types of metaphors as well. So this is a really critical question um, that comes up all the time. I mean, how exactly are we going to discuss um, micro-credentials and where do they fit in within this wider space? Um, and what kinds of metaphors do we use to talk about them with an awareness that no metaphor is neutral? All metaphors are grounded in, in some sort of assumption, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, uh, sometimes both, but that it's important to think about it in that in that kind of uh, phase or fra uh, framework and a sort of thinking process as well. So this is a really useful strategy that Mark has developed and he's labeling but it's a very useful way of thinking about it. when we're talking about definitions, there are two axes. One hand he has the bundled versus unbundled access. And then on the other hand, he has the credit bearing versus non-credit bearing uh, access. So you can see up there that in the upper left hand corner, uh, formal degrees, for example, um, a traditional third level degree um, would fit into that space. So it's bundled and it's credit bearing. And then if we head down, we might see structured short courses, which are bundled, they're all together, um, but they're also non-credit bearing. So many of them don't actually yield credit. Then in the upper right hand corner, we'll see where there's really quite a bit of potential here about stackable micro credentials. So they're unbundled. You can do one, you know, or you can do two, as many as you want, and that they are credit bearing. So they're actually, as we say, woven into our qualification frameworks. That's a really important point. And then down in the lower right hand corner, you'll see non formal badges and certificates. So these are things that are both unbundled. So they're not, you know, a college degree. But they're also non-credit bearing, so you can see that they're, you know, maybe within that framework, they exist in a different space. And the reason that it's important to talk about it in this light is that we really need to understand what we mean when we mean a micro-credential, because, you know, and this is, again, something that has come up across our research agenda, has been the number of times people will say, you mean a digital badge, you mean a... And the answer is that it might mean a digital badge, but it's unclear, you know, so the actual target demographic, we might say, of a stackable micro-credential might be extremely different to a non-formal badge and certificate space. Um, but they're often, pardon the kind of use of the word again, but they're often bundled together in a way that's probably not quite appropriate. So we need more conceptual clarity about different types of qualifications for different types of purposes, and for different types of experiences as well, um, within lifelong learning, in reskilling for the job market, that these are all different or differing perhaps slightly differing spaces that really need to be clarified in more detail now when it comes to these questions an important note as well is the fact that none of this exists in a vacuum um, and i think this is probably one of the critical points this is a recent paper by shane ralston about micro credentials and the neoliberal learning economy so the fact that when we're talking about unbundling we often have to consider what are we unbundling, what are we unbundling it for, and who are we unbundling it for, and perhaps also for what purpose. So this is a really provocative and very good paper that talks about this in detail, and that a lot of these questions, and as we say, these implicit assumptions, really need to be questioned when we're talking about them um, within the academic sphere, and when we're talking about different stakeholders within this sphere as well. These are critical questions and critical elements. So we have a few 
questions and metaphors to finish up with. This first one, in Ireland, we call this a shopping trolley. I'm sure it's called a lot of things around Europe. Um, but we really need to ask, do we want to see students essentially become consumers? And what I mean by that is that, you know, students will walk down the shelves, they'll pick this credential, they'll pick that credential, they'll put it all in their trolley um, and they'll head to the checkout because that itself is a metaphor that's based very much on a particular economic logic. And it's also based quite strongly on um, a consumeristic way of looking at the world that students will pick and choose, that they'll develop and their own repertoires. These are not bad things, but what's important to consider when we're talking about them is that they're also not neutral things. And as Ralston argues, and many other would argue, when we're talking about education, sometimes there's actually an extra level to that. It's not necessarily a consumer product. So we need to be careful when we're talking about these metaphors also. A second issue is one that's actually come up in some of the projects we've been working on, this concept of a wallet, you know, backpack, um, these are interesting metaphors as well because, again, they actually have a certain logic baked into them. So, you know, for example, a wallet implies currency, it implies capital, it implies movement. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the metaphor. That's an important point, but that we do need to talk about these assumptions. And particularly, again, if we go back to that schematic that Mark developed, where our different qualification frameworks are fitting in and for what purpose. That's a, this is a critical question and it's going to confront us as we move further down this path. And then the last common metaphor is the passport, you know, um, and again, really nothing wrong with it, really nice one, but something we should ask is, you know, millions of people around the world don't have a passport, they don't have citizenship, and um, the vast majority of human beings have never been on an airplane. So when we're talking about travel, when we're talking about transport movement, we have to bring these questions in they're not neutral. We have to talk about who's going where and for what purpose. And um, so these are big questions. But as you saw at the start, when we're talking about these big ideas, we need to put micro credentials like any other concept within that specific space. It's very important to do this and to talk and to challenge some of these questions and confront them openly also. So essentially, in conclusion, I've only got a couple of slides here. Um, the first one is about being around the table. So this is an important point Mark was making, is the fact that you really do want to be around these tables. You want to be in these discussions, talking to your colleagues. It's the only way that any of us learn. He also has a proverb. He claims it's an Irish proverb. I'm not sure if it really is, but um, about that if you're not around the table, you might be on the menu. So there's a little bit of that involved also, that as an institution, we want to be part of these conversations. But in addition to that, not only do we want to be part of these conversations, we also want to shape them. Um, and then given this context as well, the context that we're in, uh, it's important to note this also, that we are European. All of us are European here, and that we actually, a lot of these questions, these big issues, are going to be dealt with at a European level, and not only dealt with, because that sounds a little bit simplistic. It's not that they're going to be dealt with, but they're going to be shaped. So we have to move beyond our national boundaries, while also being aware of the context that we exist in. So we exist in a national framework, a European framework also. So what I will say is thank you, or I also use my native Irish as well, um, at the same time. And I apologize as well, because I know my camera went off during, and what I will do is I will stop sharing, um, and hopefully there will be time for questions too. Apologies again, everyone. I'm not sure what went wrong there. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you, Kantar. Uh, if anyone has any questions, the, please feel free to ask before we move on to our next presentation. Hi, may I speak? This is Kareen. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, I really appreciate your presentation and in particular, I loved in the future section that you had this whole um, critical issue around language and metaphors. My question to you is, what are some of the current language and metaphors that you are conceptualizing when you're thinking about micro-credential? And I'm speaking of this, I mean, I'm not a European, I'm actually a Canadian, and I'm kind of interested in knowing uh, what is any thinking and the initial thinkings around these questions, because I think it's 
clearly for me from attending other presentations on my like credential today, um, it might look a bit rigid looking from the outside, looking at the way that Europeans are trying to codify micro credentials. So I'm kind of curious to see if you have any initial thoughts about, you know, metaphors that might be useful going forward. Mm. Well, thanks very much for the question. And I mean, I, I think one that springs straight to mind, and it is a, I think it's a nice one, is that this idea of an ecology. Um, and particularly the idea that we might be talking about very different, it's not necessarily going to be a jungle, but sometimes when you when you hear people talk about it, it, it does seem a bit like a jungle, you know. I'm just catching up with the chats there, and I noticed that there's a lot of questions about exactly how would you define it? Is it is a badge or micro credential? Um, and part of the issue that comes up there definitely is um, having those metaphors that can actually reflect the diversity that's involved in this issue while also being coherent enough, I think, to, to constitute a metaphor, because I think that would be an, an issue, I think, that arises. But that's why I think an ecological approach is a nice way to put it, because we can think about it, different institutions are involved in, in different spaces, doing different things, and um, that will be perhaps comparable, but at the same time, they might not be um, equivalent or they, they may not be identical. So I, I would go for the ecology metaphor. I think it's a nice one. Uh, it gives enough flexibility for people to talk about it individually and, and also as well comparably. I think that's a really important thing is because it strikes me that confusion that's definitely emerging is, well, if I take a micro-credential with this institution, what does that mean at that institution? You know, so even when we're talking about unbundled, stackable, things like this, we need to have some metric of stacking them, or maybe not a metric, but we need to have some sort of uh, understood definition. So I think, as you say, it's a critical question, um, and language and metaphor are really the center of it as well. Um, but I would go for the, not the law of the jungle, but I do think that viewing it almost as a space with many different types of, um, of qualification that can then somehow be related to each other, I think that's probably the future. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, you answered my question. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for the question. Uh, Ida, may I ask something? Of course. Uh, just uh, under what conditions do you regard digital badges as also micro-credentials? What do you just uh, request to have uh, to, to make it a digital credential? Yes, I mean, this is, this is a really interesting question. And in a sense, I guess, an, a line that could be drawn, and I think it's drawn in the um, schematic, is the idea of, is it credit bearing? So, for example, one could imagine, you know, I, I, I'm sure everyone on this call has gotten a digital badge for one thing or another. You know, digital badge could be contributing. It can be, you know, uh, asking a question, answering a question. You know, a digital badge can fit into that space. But perhaps then, if, if we're taking that approach, then a way to think of a micro-credential might be that it's credit-bearing or credit-yielding so that it fits within um, a framework where it can be essentially not only validated, but also that it represents a specific sort of outcome. So that might be a fine distinction. Um, but I think that it's an important sort of line there is the concept of credentialing, um, because I think badges... And it's part of, we actually conducted a literature review at the start of our project with the ECIU, and we were very surprised how much more prevalent the phrase digital badge was than micro-credential. Um, and I think that the reason for that is because a digital badge is essentially kind of the danger of what we were just talking about. It's a catch-all term. Um, everything and anything can be a digital badge. So then the question becomes, well, then what is a micro-credential? And I would say that the credit-yielding aspect could be the distinction um, that it's more structured, perhaps, and more formal. Um, so I don't know, does that answer the question? Or? I think it's the best expression I, I heard until now, credit bearing, because it has got the EC test unit, it has got uh, assessment, it has got uh, the same metadata as the digital credential should possess. So the digital metadata make it a credential and the, the uh, credit bearing just express everything which is necessary. It's a very good idea. Thank you. No problem. Um, are there any other questions? 
Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now we can move to uh, George Bubak from the DTU, who will be talking to us about the uh, MOOC consortium as well. So, George, please take the stage. Yeah, thanks uh, for the introduction. I'm trying to, uh, going to share my screen now. Uh, one moment. Uh, let me see if it works like that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I hope that I you can hear me well, otherwise please notify me that I put the camera off as well. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, what already was uh, introduced in the, in the former presentation about the uh, common microcredentials framework that is being developed by our European uh, MOOC consortium. And um, to give you first the, the context of the development of CMF, uh, the MOOC consortium was established by ENITU in 2017, end of 2017, as we felt the need for a better representation of European MOOCs um, and expertise in that, um, in that field uh, than was currently the case, because uh, Europe was very much divided by, by language and offerings of MOOCs by country, uh, and therefore didn't have a very strong voice, also not towards the European Commission, as well as, as, a, as, a, well, as a voice as, as European MOOC providers in general. So we uh, approached uh, several bigger MOOC platforms uh, with the idea of building this European MOOC consortium. And then we had the launch of EMC end of 2017 with inclusion of FutureLearn, Fun in France, uh, OpenABED, EduOpen, and Media, Myriada X. Um, and together we, um, uh, well, we, we formulated uh, uh, the objectives um, for this EMC. But most importantly also, we are immediately representing more than 3,000 MOOCs in Europe and also more than 400 higher education institutions and using five uh, different languages, European languages. So we have, all together with EMC, a bigger impact. And this is very important as EMC is the vehicle now for this European MOOC consortium with 400 higher education institutions that are endorsing this CMF. And that is um, quite a distinctive factor in, in our initiative in relation to other smaller um, projects or initiatives. To relate this very uh, uh, strongly to the labor market, we also involved um, employment agencies and companies in a project called European MOOC Consortium for the Labor Market. And I'm going to talk about this um, in a second more. Um, first of all, the European MOOC Consortium uh, has its main goal is to increase the awareness and the use of digital education and MOOCs within Europe. That's our general goal. But um, we want also to increase the impact uh, and the exposure of all the, um, the MOOC platforms um, together, as well as separately by cooperation. So we, we bring them together to uh, share expertise, but also try to find connections between the, the, the MOOC offerings and make them into programs together in, in uh, consultation. Further, we want to make MOOCs uh, a widely considered option for employers and employees um, as part of the educational system. So uh, now it's, it's just being used as um, an addition, like, like taking a, a separate MOOC, but it's not so much seen as, as a real uh, offering for continuing education. Um, and, and therefore, we, we want to make programs that are fit um, to the market and being in line with, with what is demand driven. Um, and it's especially therefore that we have to create this dialogue with social partners and, civ and civil society organizations and employment agencies within the EMC labor market project to, uh, to make MOOCs uh, fit for the, for the labor market. Why is it so of great importance? Well, first of all, it was concluded in the EU Education Training Monitor 2017 that life and learning, continuing education, and continuous professional development are actually underdeveloped in large parts of the EU, realizing also that 40% of European employers face problems with recruiting employees, uh, having the right qualifications and the right skills for the demands of the, uh, of the uh, economy, especially also the, the more digitalized economy. Uh, in that sense, we also have the feeling that continuing education is actually becoming even bigger than campus uh, education. Um, in a sense that careers are becoming longer and continuing education is becoming more, more important. Um, 
So to meet the needs of, of the labor market, we also have to think about complementary market mechanisms. We have to think about uh, different than universities um, uh, educating uh, students se uh, separately. We are more thinking about clusters, sector-oriented education, which is more in line with the demands from, uh, from, the, uh, from the economy. And therefore, structural co collaboration is needed with the stakeholders in the, in the market. So therefore, we bring together new platforms, universities, public employment services, um, and uh, in, in a structured, collaborative way um, to, to have uh, offerings which are flexible and scalable uh, for the continuing education market. Um, here summarized, you see that we, we, we are developing this framework to de defining the role of, uh, of MOOC platforms, universities, employment services together. Um, we bring them together to co-develop, co-deliver, and using MOOCs and short learning programs for, for continuous education. Um, and we have started with an analysis of the position of MOOCs for the labor market. That was the, the first part of this EMCLM uh, project. And uh, next to that, we strengthen the European uh, platform in sharing expertise and collaboration. Um, yeah, what is actually uh, missing at this moment to uh, make the, the big step for MOOCs being uh, considered as a uh, as a valuable educational resource for, for continuing education is the clarity of qualifications. So that is of utmost importance, not only for the learners, the university, but also for employers to really accept um, the MOOCs and short learning programs, um, uh, but to, to have an added value in the educational sector. At this moment, there is no consistency in these qualifications and actually leading to, uh, to confusion. Here you have a table in which you, we, there is an analysis done about 450 MOOC-based uh, micro-credentials. And there you already see a big difference in the, in the length of, of courses, um, uh, also in the, um, uh, in the, in the credentials um, uh, in, the, in the courses. And that is actually uh, very much confusing. And therefore, uh, the value is, uh, is not, not as big. It is um, for employees very difficult to see what the new employee is uh, bringing to their company. So our ambition, therefore, uh, uh, of the European MOOC Consortium in relation to micro-credentials is to lay the foundation for a new qualification to address the needs of employers and learners looking for smaller units in that, and that develop relevant skills. Uh, we want to enable courses to be recognized and stackable. And here you see the, the overview, which was also uh, mentioned or referred to in the first um, presentation. This is a, uh, the model, the common microfinancial framework. And uh, this is not something that, we, that has come from one brainstorm. This has taken us um, quite some time uh, to fix this, uh, this framework in consultation with the um, high education institutions linked to the MOOC platforms. In summary, it is about 100, 150 hours uh, workload uh, representing four to six ECTS, depending on the, on the country. Uh, important is the connection also with the European Qualification uh, Framework, level 6, 7, but also 8, PhD level, and with the option of level 5, as long as there is a combination of ECTS, so at academic level. The need is there to provide assessment, um, uh, provide assessment enabling the award of an academic uh, credit. Reliability methods of ID uh, verification and the strength transcript setting of the, uh, of the learning outcomes. This all feeds in to really uh, being able to assess the, the value of this, um, of this program with a micro credential. Uh, next is that, so the purpose summarized of the common micro credential is to encourage the development of a qualification that will better meet the needs of modern learners. The framework helps you to gain knowledge, skills, have a high education level in smaller units, and um, it allows you for learning to be recognized towards formal qualifications in a seamless way. Um, here you see where it is positioned then. So you have, uh, we have, they have short courses. There are many of these um, short courses that which uh, receive certificates, badges. We see micro-credentials more as the uh, part of formal education, always with ECTS connected. So these are academic. Uh, formal education, higher education, and they are stackable towards uh, degrees. Uh, I think it's even the same slide that was used in the, um, uh, we, um, here at FutureLearn, where represents uh, uh, specifically programs, uh, MOOCs, 
that are uh, awarded with the, C, uh, with the CMF. This is uh, our ambition, is to uh, have a growing number of programs in line with this, becoming more of a qualification, which for uh, learners is really um, well, a, a kind of a, a benchmark, so they know uh, this is, when I follow this course, this is recognized, this is stackable and, and quality controlled. Uh, it's not only on FutureLearn, also on, on our other platforms of fun, you know, the Exxon, but we will have this um, uh, list of um, CMF awarded uh, programs, like also was introduced with the DCU um, the program of FinTech. To further formalize and mainstream uh, our am ambition here on CMF is that we have also an, uh, a name for this uh, qualification, which is called CADEO. Uh, this is not the only name. This is the name for CMF awarded programs, the CADEO, which is adopted by, at this moment, by, by Myriad X, uh, AD Open, and FUN. Uh, this is not necessarily the name that also is being used by, by FutureLearn. Um, this could be a different name. We are currently exploring this. But in the end, uh, uh, we will have a, a similar, like an ISO certification, CMF awarded programs under the name Cadeo or different names. So uh, we are working uh, uh, at the moment at this um, uh, well, uh, recognizing ability of these uh, CMF programs and also discussing it with the Commission and, and Eurofunds. That is the state of affairs. And for us now, we, we are looking for further endorsement by more higher education uh, institutions to work uh, uh, to recognize these programs, to develop programs in line with CMF, and uh, for the Commission to also um, include this in, in the Europe Plus. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll give the floor back to the Chair. Thank you, George. Uh, if anyone has any questions for George, please go ahead and ask. Just one question to George. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah, this is Jean Zilas from Geneva. And um, I noticed that at last slide you, you have mentioned that our firm, that this uh, France University Numérique, right? So yeah. it's a French uh, MOOC platform. So uh, I, I'm curious to know why, why, you, why you chose FARM to start with this project. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we actually we have um, looked for uh, the bigger platforms in, in Europe, the MOOC providers, and uh, these are typically um, uh, more language bound. So we have French, Italian, Spanish, and the UK by Futureman. Um, uh, we, we do not exclude other um, platforms in Europe. So we are, we are expecting also a German platform and MOOC uh, to, to join uh, soon. Um, FUN has been very active uh, in this field and they, um, uh, they have really felt the need to, uh, as one of the first of our platforms that we represent, felt the need to have this as a registered um, name, this qualification. And they've taken this initiative of Gadeo, which is now being registered under the uh, brand uh, name. So, um, and then they asked also for the other platforms to join the name of Cardeo, and this is now done by by Myriada X and uh, and Lady Open. And the the more platforms that endorse this uh, these uh, qualific this qualification under CMF and under the name Cardeo, the stronger, of course, the, rec the recognizability of uh, CM CMF awarded uh, programs. For now, uh, for practical reasons, we only give CMF. Award programs uh, to um, the, the 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 programs under under CMF uh, under uh, the EMC uh, platforms. So only for universities that are currently connected to these four platforms, or five platforms, including OpenEd. Uh, and later on, uh, we will expand this also for uh, universities uh, European wide or even wider. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ferenc, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you. George, it was very, very uh, uh, mind-opening, your um, uh, lecture. Uh, the previous uh, presenter just mentioned that credit bearing 
means that uh, uh, micro credential have the uh, properties you just mentioned uh, in your uh, project also. Uh, so you make you just define the content of making it credit bidding, I think. But what I do not understood, the, what did you mean on that it is only for further education and not for degree course, it's a part of a degree course, or may I misunderstood this? Yeah, no. No, that's great, because um, yeah, you can, uh, these programs for same education often are coming from, from universities and they are often also part of the, um, uh, the bachelor programs, uh, the, uh, the campus based programs. Um, the only thing is that we want to have, we actually install the, the micro credentials to, to serve the market for continuing education because there the qualification is, is, is missing. So we just bachelor the masters, the PhDs, and shows really the, the added value. There you have in this market for continuing education, you have certificates and badges. <laughs> To solve um, uh, that problem of, of, of recognizability and, and seeing the added value, um, we see uh, uh, a task for the micro credentials for, for having a new qualification like, like CMF. Then you could have the discussion like, should we also give um, a CMF qualification for, let's say, uh, a first or second year student at a university yeah, of 18, 19 years old? Um, uh, then you have the discussion. Uh, that could technically be possible, but then you are cutting up programs. And the question then is, uh, aren't you very much stimulating for students to just finish their, uh, their, their, um, uh, their bachelor program as such, or, uh, um, or then giving incentives of break it, breaking that up and, and making it a whole collection of, of these micro-credentials. So therefore, uh, at this moment, we, we think these micro-credentials are um, mainly meant for uh, formal higher education, continuing education, uh, the bachelor and master system is, is already a well-functioning system and should stay as it is. Uh, the micro-credentials, uh, CMF qualification is meant for the market of continuing education where we are missing such qualifications. But that is why we made that distinction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. We also have a question in the chat from Corinne. Uh, where is the validation coming for, for the EMC? Is it coming from the European universities or the EU Commission? Um, yeah, so it, uh, you mean the validation of, of CMF then? Uh, uh, so the, um, the, uh, the European Commission uh, is, is now being involved get further endorsement also from the European Commission and we are also involved in this um, commissioners uh, expert pool on expert group on the micro credentials uh, so we are uh, talking to the Commission on this um, the validation is based on the um, endorsement by the by the universities uh, uh, connected to the European uh, platforms the European MOOC platforms and the actual execution of the validation in um, certifying so, uh, more or less the, uh, the program as being CMF is then um, done by EDTU as the coordinator of the European MOOC Consortium um, uh, on behalf of the, of the, of the five MOOC platforms. So you have this layer, EDTU is providing this um, uh, qualification on behalf of the five uh, MOOC platforms representing more than 400 higher education institutions. So that, that is how the, the, the system uh, works. But to keep it under control at this moment, we only apply CMF for, um, uh, for those uh, higher education institutions connected to EMC. And also we have a short learning programs uh, um, initiative with ED2 in which we have all the open universities uh, connected uh, within Europe. These programs are also um, uh, applicable for, uh, for, for CMF. Okay, thank you, George. I hope that answered your question, Corinne. Uh, and if there are no more questions, we could proceed to the workshop part of this uh, session. 
Um, okay, no more questions, I guess. So uh, I know we've all had a lot of information overload today, but please bear with us for a few more minutes. Uh, now I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the MicroHE project. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my video. Uh, but anyways, um, we have heard a lot about micro-credentials today. And uh, if you've had the opportunity to attend some of the sessions this morning, I'm uh, trusting that you are familiar with some of the ter terminology involved. So uh, last year, we conducted a discussion among a gathering of experts from all over Europe in Slovenia. And the group was made up of some policymakers, some educators in the field, and even some tech companies. Uh, the discussions uh, revolved around uh, estimating what kind of impact micro-credentials can have on various as aspects of uh, higher educational institutions, uh, such as changing learner paradigms and uh, inter- and intra-institutional processes, among others. Uh, the participants then also tried to identify what would be the driving factors for such kind of impacts. Um, in other words, how could we use technology and uh, Uh, sorry, uh, I just uh, technology and policy making specifically as tools to drive those those changes uh, when it comes to micro credentials. We collected this information and refined it over time and came up with some uh, some of these impact statements and driving forces that could enable these impacts. And now in this workshop, we'll uh, try to analyze some of those with you. Uh, coming back to the practicalities. Uh, once you are assigned into groups, there will be four groups in total. Uh, you will be going to your own uh, breakout sessions. And uh, once you are there, uh, you will uh, access this link that I'll just share with you. Uh, but I'll share my screen just to show you. Okay, so uh, this is the our workshop uh, whiteboard, so to speak. Uh, and uh, you can zoom in on... Um, every corner of this uh, whiteboard. So the, the, there are four corners on this, each meant for group, uh, different groups. So group one and two are on the top and group three and four are on the bottom. Uh, you'll see that there are uh, three of these impact statements that every group will have. And uh, some of these uh, uh, drivers that we identified over here on top, all you have to do is uh, go one by one through each statement and uh, figure out the top five uh, driving factors that you think would enable that particular statement from uh, these. And once you have figured that out, you can just drag them over here in, in an order, uh, order of importance. So if you think that including micro-credentials into Bologna process is the most important driving factor, then it goes to number one and uh, just an example and then you can just drag number two here so it works like that if you feel like some of the drivers here uh, are do not pro provide enough information you can simply uh, try to add a new note all you have to do is uh, go here or maybe select a square and uh, just type your message I'm just showing how to do it and it will be added here and then you can just simply drag it to where you think it's important. So the main thing to remember here is to stick to your own corner of the group. Uh, so we have enough space here for four groups and uh, please feel free to add any extra driving factors that you think are not mentioned in the list uh, right next to remarks. Um, I'll share the link uh, for this in the uh, in the chat. Just give me a second. So please feel free to access that link. And if you uh, miss some instructions, they are on the board again, over uh, on the Flinger board. Uh, and now uh, Timothy will uh, divide you into groups, and you'll be in your own breakout sessions for twenty minutes. Please, uh, we encourage discussion and critical thinking. Uh, so please go ahead and start. Okay, so uh, I was just waiting because one group was still there. Yeah, mm, so uh, I hope you guys had some good discussion when doing this activity. I heard there was, there was some confusion in the beginning, 
but it's good to see that the board is quite filled up and everyone found their way around it. And uh, all the impact statements were different for each group. So please feel free to have this link. And if you want to, uh, the Flinger link, I mean, and if you want to look at the statements that the other groups went through and the drivers that they thought were more important, then you can access it. it the board will remain open uh, indefinitely. And thank you so much for uh, your contribution. And thank you, Kanthar and uh, George, for their presentations. And a thank you to everyone who made it today and stayed with us till the end. It's quite late in the evening I, uh, from work perspective, but uh, we are very glad to have you. And thank you, Tim, for the technical support. I'll share the link. To thank the you. Again. Thanks, guys. Thank you.